uh, good evening. It's uh, very. Uh, I'm very glad to hear to see you here and uh, to have you like uh, visitors of this uh, exhibition and uh, this laser talk. So um, at laser talk we do during and uh, exhibition the artwork as a living system of Krista Sommerer and Laurent Mignonneau that organized uh, in collaboration b b by Imal and it was already shown in ZKM Karlsruhe and also it was shown Oxe Oke Center in uh, Linz and here you will be able to come back and to see this exhibition that will be open till September. We will discuss now the intersection between biology, technology and art and the use of biological system and processes serves as metaphor for the complex relationship between human nature and digital world. Today uh, I would like to introduce to you but you already, who are here, you met already, artist Krista Sommerel and Laurent Mignonneau, pioneer of the interactive art and artificial life. Particularly, uh, they are very, have particularly, they use a very interesting uh, computer algorithm and the interactive interfaces to create works that engage with the viewer in a new and unique ways. They have worked in, in this field since uh, 1992 and their work has been exhibited in major museum and in the galleries. And what is particular interesting because uh, they are use advanced technologies and scientific concept to create thought provoking artworks that challenge our relationship with the natural world and our understanding of life itself. Dr. Elio Tusim, a researcher in interdisciplinary domain of bio-inspired robotics and computational intelligence. and in his research activity, he draws inspiration from nature to design control mechanism to allow artificial agents to operate in a complex environment and to learn from their experience in an autonomous way. He researches in the field of artificial life with a focus on using robotic and computational models to understand the behavior of biological system. And I would like to introduce you Florian Zanata, who will be moderate this laser talk. He is uh, conducting research projects on the Moses uh, biogeography and urban ecology. During his PhD thesis in the University of Liège, he developed a novel framework for dynamic ecological niche models, integrated species-specific and specially explicit migration simulation in order to explore Bryophytes potential migration capacity through wind dispersal in the context of climate changing. In 2021, he co-founded a citizen urban ecology non-profit lab in Liège called La Cime, which develops science communication and sci <coughs> citizen science-based research project and activities. Well, we will start our conference with a presentation by the participant of their work. And I would like to uh, give uh, the floor to Dr. Elo Tusi. Good evening, everybody. Thank you very much uh, for the introduction. It's uh, really a pleasure for me to be here uh, this evening uh, with, with this artist. I'm not an artist myself. And uh, what I've tried to do in this uh, uh, short talk is just to justify <laughs> my presence here with uh, some of my work. Um, that I've been doing uh, with uh, robots. So I've been doing research for about uh, more than 20 years and uh, some of this work uh, is with uh, um, a little uh, robot and I will show you some of this, uh, some of this work. And, but I will uh, uh, focus my talk on three points that you see here in the title. Evolutionary algorithm, autonomy as well behavior because these three points, I think there are, they create some connection, loose connection maybe between my work uh, and uh, the, the amazing, uh, nice work that you have seen uh, 
by Christa and, uh, and Laurent. So I'm a, I'm a professor at the University of Namur, and uh, I would like uh, to start uh, um, actually from, uh, from, can you hear myself? Because I, I'm, I'm not very used to talk to a microphone, so I, I need to get used to it. Um, um, I was saying, uh, uh, I would like to start uh, from, uh, uh, let's call it uh, uh, a metaphor, maybe a bit uh, <laughs> stretched, but I hope uh, that you, you stay with me, where, where I compare a, um, um, a scientist that design a robot with the visitors that enter into a museum or an art uh, installation. And obviously, I guess you agree with me that when the visitors uh, is in, in front of the artistic work, it, it creates uh, this kind of uh, empathy. So like uh, the, the glance, the, the, the look at the, the artistic work, it becomes immediately empathic. And uh, the artistic work uh, triggers emotion in the in the visitors, and the visitors apply attribute some some meaning and emotion to the, the artistic work. Uh, the same things, uh, more or less, happen probably with less empathy, but happens uh, uh, in science when you when someone tries to design. Uh, uh, control system for autonomous robots, in particular for autonomous robots that are required to operate in a natural and dynamic and unconstrained environment. So what the, the scientist does is just what I would do if I was the robot. So what kind of rule uh, does the robot need to be able to cope with the challenges of the environment? So, so what the, the scientist does is try to put his head in the robot and try to, to develop some rule uh, that then become the mechanisms that drives the behavior of the robot. And so you see this, uh, this, uh, this strong interaction between the designer that at some point become the robot itself to try to develop uh, the, the solution to the, to, to the problem of the robot. Uh, now, in the, in the case of, uh, uh, in the, case of uh, uh, the work of uh, Christa and Laurent, this uh, interaction, it becomes uh, really immersive. The visitors has the possibility to interact uh, with the artistic work and to give uh, uh, motion and dynamics to the artistic work. In my case, uh, it's actually the opposite. I try as much as possible to disappear, to <laughs> reduce at minimum this, uh, 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 this process of becoming myself the robot because I don't I want to avoid to inject some bias into into the robot so I don't want the robot to solve the problem in the way in which I would solve it but I want the robot to solve the problems in in his own way and the reason why I want to do this is because I want the robot to be autonomous and uh, uh, my idea of autonomy I guess you agree is that uh, a system is autonomous when it's capable of developing its own rules. So, like uh, people in a the country, they're autonomous if they can decide by themselves how to manage their uh, social and political life. Uh, for the robot, is the same. The robot will be truly autonomous when it will be able to develop its own way to interact uh, with the uh, environment. But in order to do this, uh, um, the designer has to make a step back <laughs> and let the robot to, to find his own way to solve the problem, which is actually very, very difficult. Um, now, the reason why you want to have the robot uh, autonomous is because, from my point of view, only if you have truly autonomy, you can have intelligence. And it's also true that uh, any autonomous system, uh, so any system that can autonomously define its identity and uh, uh, making itself alive is also intelligent. Um, but the, the, the interesting point, so you see here, the, 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 we start from a difference between what I do, which is to actually try to disappear <laughs> as much as possible from the robot point of view, while they try to make the visitors as interactive as possible. Uh, so we, 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 we start from two opposite processes, but the way in which we do it is uh, very interesting with the, actually the same methods. And these are methods uh, that uh, we draw from uh, uh, from uh, nature, so in particular uh, natural evolution. So from natural evolution, we um, we take the three, bas three basic uh, ingredients of uh, uh, of the evolutionary process, so the genetic inheritance, the variability, and the selection, to uh, generate uh, 
uh, in my case, to generate uh, the, uh, the, the control system that drives the behavior of the robot. Whereas in Christian Laurent, you have seen the, I think in the pool, uh, the, the creatures uh, are controlled by a kind of evolutionary algorithm. So evolutionary algorithm is a, is a family of algorithm which is inspired by the mechanism of evolution you see here with the three ingredients. And this is a kind of flow chart that describes uh, uh, what's happening in, a, in an evolutionary process. So in an evolutionary process, uh, we I, 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 I obviously I, I describe it in the context of uh, of my work, which is the, the design of a control system. We um, generate a population of solution, which is just a string of uh, a string of numbers. Uh, each string of numbers, actually, we call it a genotype, and each number in this string we call it actually gene. And then we each string uh, is a kind of solution. Then we we transform with the coding the solution into a, into a control system. Then we evaluate the control system, and then once all the solutions have been evaluated, we, we, we rank them, we select them, the best, and then we keep on uh, evolving, uh, the, um, we keep on running uh, the, the algorithm, the mechanism, until we are satisfied with the solution. The advantage of this process is that uh, what the designer does uh, is mainly two things. It defines uh, the ingredient of the evolution, so the building blocks with which the evolution creates the solution, with which let's say the evolutionary algorithm, create the solution, and then we define the fitness function. The fitness function is just a formalism that scores the behavior of the robot. And the fitness function can be very, very general. So I can, I can have a, a very, very complex task for a robot, and I can simply say, uh, you have done very well or you have not done very well. Or I can be a bit more uh, uh, specific, saying how much good the solution was. But I never say, how the robot should solve the problem. Is the evolution that find the solution, and myself, I just uh, drive the evolution towards a certain direction with this fitness function. And in my case, now I don't want to enter into too much detail, to annoy you with this <laughs> detail, but the, when, I, when I was saying that I uh, code the, um, so the solution has this genetic, uh, this string of numbers, and then the string of numbers are coded into a control system, the control system is in large majority of the cases an artificial neural network. Uh, maybe nowadays you have been all familiar with the chat GPT. Chat GPT, for example, is based on a huge uh, <laughs> uh, neural network. I'm using very small neural network. Neural network can be just uh, represented as a direct graph, so with nodes and connection between nodes. And uh, there are some parameters that need to be found, and the, the evolutionary algorithm help us to find the best combination of parameters that drives uh, optimally the behavior of the robot. Now, what I would like to do is to show you uh, some of the work I've done with this, with this approach. Like here, for example, you see this, uh, um, this uh, uh, robotic hand, which is uh, uh, a hand which is required to make a distinction between a sphere and an ellipsoid object that are very, very similar. Um, and the, the, dis the, the, the hand, uh, is only equipped with 10 binary sensors. So there are 10 binary sensors distributed around the, 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 the surface of the hand, the palm of the hand, and uh, every perceptual state uh, is by itself ambiguous. So the hand cannot distinguish between the sphere and the, and the, and the ball um, just by one touch, but it has to interact with the, with the object to, uh, to make uh, the decision. And the way in which the hand interacts with the object uh, is actually developed by the, the evolutionary algorithm. In this case, you see, uh, so you see the pioneer robot that uh, is visually uh, drived. So there is a camera, and the camera uh, points uh, in front of the, the robot. And the robot has to drive on the here the red path. Then will be a green path. Now, when when we did this work, uh, it was very challenging to interface uh, the camera with the neural network, because the camera is a very huge, uh, um, it creates a very huge input space. So what we have done, we have reduced the camera to a five by five uh, uh, grid. So actually what the robots see is actually something like this. And this is enough for the robot to remain, so this kind of coarse, very, very coarse visual system, it's enough to remain on the path. And actually, the amazing thing is that the system is even uh, adaptive in the sense that if you see here, it can uh, uh, manage to remain in the path regardless of the color of the path and on the, on the non-path area, 
which was actually the objective. The objective was to create something that would work for any possible combination of the color of the road and the color of the non-road area. Now, uh, uh, most of my work uh, um, that I've done with this kind of approach, uh, evolutionary algorithm and neural network, refer to uh, a research area which is called swarm robotics. That uh, you have seen uh, a, a, an instance of swarm behavior in the, um, in the artistic work with the bees, uh, and but also the, the um, what was the, the flyers uh, that moves in the, here uh, we are referring to, um, to a robotic system but the, um, the principle is basically the same. So these are robotic systems that are inspired by the, the behavior of social insects, like bees, ants. And uh, the idea is to have a group of robots. Each robot has its own control system. Uh, perception is, on, is only local, so there is no, for example, a, a say God view perspective that gives the robot the information of what's happening everywhere in the environment, but the robot can only locally sense the environment around this body. And uh, um, communication is stigmergic. So I don't know if you, you're familiar with this, uh, with this word. Maybe the biologist can help me. But stigmergic communication is communication through modification of the environment. So like uh, I, I move an object, and then the, the agent that comes after me see that the object has, has been moved, and then they react in a different way to the fact that this object has been moved. This is, for example, the principle that the termites used to build this huge uh, nest. Um, now, the, the challenge in swarm robotics is to move from uh, local uh, rule of behavior to the global uh, response. So what we are interested in swarm robotics is the, is the uh, collective behavior. So the robots are supposed to cooperate as to do something uh, nice uh, as a collective. But the designer can only work at the individual level. So we can only define the behavior of the individual robots and the rule of interaction between the robots. And through the interaction, the robot should generate uh, as a self, as an emerging process, uh, the global response. And here you see two instances of uh, uh, simple, relatively simple collective behavior. Like for example, this is a kind of, uh, we call it self-assembly. You see three robots. These robots they have a gripper and they have to attach to each other. And you see that before attaching, they do this kind of dance. Now, this dance is needed to decide who will make the, 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 the action of gripping and who will receive the connection. So the role, basically, in this context, the role are not assigned by hand by me. The system is completely homogeneous in the sense that all the robots are the same, and they have to negotiate between, the, between themselves who does what. And this who does what, it, it happens through this kind of dance at the beginning that, that basically breaks the symmetry and uh, help the robot to, um, to uh, autonomously allocate roles. In this other case, you see uh, four robots that are required to push this object. I mean, this object is, uh, is particularly heavy and that requires the, all the four robots to push the object for uh, the object to be transported. This robot, uh, they cannot communicate, they can only see the object, but through, they interact basically in a very, very simple way um, with uh, a mechanism based on an optic floor sensor. So the optic floor sensor is like a mouse. I guess here everybody is familiar with the mouse, the mouse uh, that we use uh, to <laughs> for our computer. So this is an optic floor sensor. We, we mount the optic floor sensor on the bottom of the robot. And what is the, what is the point of the optic floor sensor? Well, imagine a robot that uh, uh, touch the object and try to push the object. If all the other robots are pushing in the opposite direction, the robot tries to move forward, but is actually moving backwards because the other robots, uh, they, they push the object in the other direction. Whereas if the robots uh, uh, push the object, and there are other robots that push, push the object in the same direction, the robot will actually move forward. Now the optic floor sensor, it only helps the robot to distinguish between these two uh, conditions. When it push the object, and indeed makes uh, a forward movement from the condition in which you push the object, but it makes uh, a backward movement. And this is enough, uh, is, is enough uh, feedback rich enough for, for the whole robot to coordinate, and as you see here, to, f to, to find a common direction of movement and to push the object in the same direction. Uh, I don't know how I'm doing with time. Okay, so uh, not this one. 
the yeah, next watch. Okay. So um the, that movie you, that I skipped, you find out on YouTube uh, of the Unamur. <laughs> the, the, so this one, uh, just to, to finish the, some, uh, some advertisement, so I've I just been uh, awarded a, a European project, which is called BABOTS. Uh, BABOTS is the acronym for Biological Animal Robots, and what we are trying to do here is to uh, transform uh, a biological worms, C. Uh, elegans, in, we call it in robot, because through genetic modification, we can reconfigure the brain, so the, the structure and the functionality of the brain, in order to change the behavior of, the, of this worm. And uh, the, this, these particular strains of uh, C. elegans that we are using in the lab, they don't, uh, um, they don't have any collective behavior. So what we are trying to do, we are trying to inject, to engineer into this worm some form of collective behavior. And to, what we are trying to do to get this worm to do something together for us. And we will test this technology in a, a vertical farming uh, uh, environment. OK, so I think I'm running out of time. I would like to, so if you have any questions, I'm happy to, to tell you more about this project, which is a European project uh, with uh, several partners. And I would like to conclude by um, showing here the, the web page of my lab, and uh, these are all my, my PhD students and my postdoc, which are actually the, the people that are doing the work. And thank you very much uh, for your attention. Thanks for, again for inviting me here tonight. Thank you very much, Elio. Now we give the floor to Krista and Laurent. So. You have seen now already uh, his exhibition. They made a guided tour, and uh, who is following us on uh, stream, so just they can uh, look well, pictures. But in, uh, there is a lot of material also in the internet. And now we have uh, this fantastic opportunity to listen their presentation, and after you will be able uh, to also ask him qu them questions about work. Um, yeah, so thank you so much, uh, Dr. Tucci. It was really nice to see, and we did already a small talk before. So we already found quite a lot of um, commonalities and also common interest, especially when it comes to genetic algorithms and also swarming behavior or the modeling of natural phenomena. Also, of course, like you said, you know, we are coming more from the artistic approach and not so much from the scientific approach. Uh, so uh, maybe coming, uh, since many of you have been already downstairs in the um, short demonstration that we gave, uh, maybe I could uh, talk a little bit while Laurent is setting this up about the Evolve that some of you have tried. And maybe you remember we have been drawing, or we showed you how to draw something uh, on the touch panel. And then this drawing actually is a bit like what you explained, a genetic code that becomes the genetic code of the creature. And this creature's behavior, oh, it's very green. <laughs> um, the, cre the creature's genetic code is actually determined by the drawing. And uh, it's like a string that can be uh, propagated to the next generation. And um, I don't know why it's so green. Mm -hmm. Uh, but um, the uh, idea is basically that we often use uh, drawings or uh, also um, drawings or also uh, other input data that are coming from the visitors and use this as a genetic code or like in the case of the typewriter that you showed, the text was used as a genetic code which then can later be uh, transformed and propagated to the next generation. So we have been using this idea of, so it's very green, okay. Does this have to do, maybe if you don't do the mirror mode? Mm -hmm. Very strange. I mean, it fits to us green, but <laughs> it's maybe a little strange to have everything in this uh, green color. Um, 
Anyway, I can talk about the works, maybe it's easier. So um, genetic algorithms for us is insofar quite interesting is because um, we can use them uh, in order to make evolutionary or simulate evolutionary systems and um, variability. I think you mentioned it uh, in your talk that um, this idea of genetic inheritance uh, and evolutionary algorithms is a way to generate something that was not there before and let the system actually give you solutions and propositions. So, um, for example, if I briefly explain uh, Evolve, you draw a shape, then this shape is the genetic code for the creature. It determines how it looks, it determines the colors and the shape, and it also determines the behavior. So if you make a very good design uh, under apostrophe, then this creature can become very fast and eventually it becomes very aggressive because the faster it is, the more it moves around and the higher its chances uh, to kill other creatures and eat up the energy of the other creatures. And uh, if this creature then succeeds to eat up the energy of the enemy, or of the of the prey, then uh, this energy is added to its own uh, energy level and then it could uh, have enough energy to mate and look for a mate. But we don't know where it finds the next mate. It really totally depends on who is around and what other creatures are there. And if there's no other creatures there, of course, uh, its lifetime will be used up after a while and it will die. So I can show you. Thanks, Laurent, for fixing this so quickly. So um, this field of artificial life is insofar for us interesting because it helps us to make these open-ended and recombinatory artworks uh, by linking the user interaction to the image production. And by applying these genetic algorithms and genetic programming, we can uh, look for some form of emergence. I think it, this is also what we have seen, this emergence behavior between the three little robots to us humans, it looks like they have intelligence because somehow they have organized themselves suddenly to, you know, connect to each other or to push this little, like you showed us really nicely, this little stick forward. And this is an emergent behavior that is happening by itself without that you programmed it. And this is exactly what we are also interested in, this emergent behavior that comes from the system itself and also from the interaction. So a uh, design that is not predetermined and not predesigned by us, but emerges through the interaction. Here we see, this was a long time ago at the Van Gogh Museum, where we see some children interacting with these creatures. And um, so the creatures swim, they mate, they uh, evolve, they interact between each other, but also with the visitors. And this leads to this very unpredictable um, designs and unpredictable behavior, behaviors. So as I said, the drawing is actually the genetic code. And uh, if you imagine, or if you can sort of, we cut basically all these parameters here, x, y, and z. All these parameters are then, I show you here. Uh, actually, this is our genetic code of one creature. This is one creature's genetic code. This is the genetic code of the other creatures. Then when they mate, we just swap over some parts of their genetic code basically mix them up in a way, like you would be mixing it. Then this is the offspring. Then we add a bit of random. Random is also important. So we have crossover. We um, add a mutation by, for example, inversion and deletion. And then you get the child creature that looks a bit similar to the parents, but has also new features as well. And this is important. You know, All of you, you are the products of your parents' genetic code and also your grandparents and the other ancestors before. So everybody of us is individual and very specific through this genetic uh, you know, evolution. And this is super exciting if you use this uh, for, for programming, for artistic works. And so what we can do with even very simple interactions, we can get very complex interactions and evolutionary structures, open-ended evolutionary structures, with some form of emergent behaviors. Uh, yeah, here also we added this idea of that you can also interfere with the system by, for example, touching the creature in the water and stop it from doing what it wanted to do. Because we also noticed this is interesting to not just have, you know, the system evolve by itself, but also give the chance of interfering and uh, add even more, more um, random and even more parameters to it. And uh, the other work that we did not really talk so much about it, but it was just next to it, maybe you want to try it later, 
It's a lamp that you can use where you can feed artificial uh, insects that are on the, on the screen. And if you feed them with light, they come to the light, they uh, catch enough light, then they have energy and they could then uh, also make children insects. And the children, again, are the mix between the parents' coat and uh, they also fly specifically depending on their, on their, uh, on their, on their look. So if an insect has a very heavy body and small wings, they may be very clumsy and they can't go forward fast. But if they have very large wings and a slim body, maybe they are very elegantly flying quicker. So it also depends on, on how they move, depending on the on the look. This was a little, I don't know if you see it. Oh, it's too dark. But you just see here that the lamp is uh, helping to make the insects come and then fly to the light. And if you are kind of delicately trying to conduct the light, you might eventually have more and more insects coming because you increase the chance that they meet and uh, create children insects. And maybe the last work I want to show you, because we don't have so much time, uh, is what Laurent demonstrated downstairs, is um, the typewriter, where the text that you type is a genetic code. So it's really directly the letters, the combination of the letters, like AAA or BBB, is the genetic code. And when then two creatures meet, they mix up the genetic code. So if you have AAA mixed with, A with BBB, maybe the child is ABA or ABB or BBA or, or BBA. So there's lots of combinations possible. And maybe there's even a C inside, because we also add a random to it. And this is why it also looks so lifelike and so kind of almost like a yeah, living system. And I don't know if I should talk about this one. This is the portrait work that we showed downstairs here. We don't use genetic algorithms. We, Laurent, actually made a very simple rule. Uh, maybe you want to explain this very simple rule, how it works uh, for the... Yes, hello. Um, yeah, the, the portrait on the fly, you have uh, maybe been uh, making your portrait downstairs with it. Uh, there are uh, about uh, 15,000 flies on the, on the screen, and uh, they, they walk randomly, uh, actually, on the screen. But they walk also on the video stream of the camera, and therefore they see the pixel value that they walk onto. And if the pixel value that they walk from the previous pixel to the new one is very different than the previous one, then they stop. And uh, by this single rule, uh, you can start to see the edges. So basically, it draws your face, your, the clothes, the silhouette uh, that uh, you perceive then uh, through the screen. And all these flies are just uh, gathering on this line. And that's how it makes the portrait. So it's a very, very simple and effective way how to actually make uh, the, the, the portrait very quickly uh, through this swarming of this uh, of these uh, flies. But it's not intelligent in the sense that they will try to make a drawing. It just happened to be at the right place at the right moment. And then you recompose with your vision uh, actually the missing parts or the missing bits that uh, they, they don't, um, uh, they, they didn't complete. So that's that's a, a kind of a, an exchange between your perception and, uh, and uh, what the flies are doing. And maybe as a very last video, we can show you maybe this one. From, uh, sorry. Maybe as a very last video we saw here also, this was shown at the Leopold Museum in Vienna on a very large facade. We covered the whole museum uh, with projection, very nice projections. Uh, and lots of ants were crawling around on the museum, which looked a little creepy, but each ant was about this size. And um, also this ant, like what you talked before, they were not intelligent as such, but by uh, following each other and climbing on the on the detecting, say for example, where the windows are or where the edges are, suddenly they made patterns, and we could sort of, you know, have those ends create shapes and forms uh, that would be not predictable, and they even would uh, write uh, some letters. Maybe you could talk briefly about how you made this with the text, how they were writing text. Mm -hmm. so, so here the algorithm is much uh, more complicated because it's. Uh, 
each each ant has to decide where they, it goes. So it's not like the flies at all. Uh, the flies are randomly going. These ones they decide, and they actually uh, perceive the environment. So they see where the edges are on the on the video, and they can actually decide uh, to follow that path or follow another one. Uh, and uh, by doing this, they reinforce the other ants to follow. So this is more, um, you can make portraits out of it, and it's similar, but, but they're actually making lines and follow the lines of your, of your portrait. And if you move, they reconfigure, and then find again where the edges are. So this is a different algorithm, but it produces uh, something that is uh, also extremely dynamic. Um, and. Uh, very effective in, in the sense that they, they will do just a, a tiny movement to just recompose the picture, the next picture, if it's, a, if it's any picture, actually, you can, you can try it. Mm -hmm. Maybe let's stop here. Maybe let's stop here because I think we don't have so much time and we should leave some time for discussion. So, uh, first, thank you once again uh, very much for your amazing uh, work and presentation uh, uh, of, of uh, tonight. And um, so I have uh, different uh, questions, questions that, you, that are addressed for the whole of you three and some particular for each. Uh, I don't know uh, if, Alexandra, you, you, you want to ask your, your question first or I start myself? Okay. Um, I have um, uh, one that is more general, so that's maybe something that you can ask uh, uh, all, um, all of you uh, from your point of view uh, that appeared to me one where w when you were presenting actually and first with the presentation of Dr. Tucci uh, about uh, when you were showing that uh, uh, for the camera for example uh, the um, the robots that was following the line you you shown that uh, in the end even the the, the camera itself um, was given giving too much information for for the the aim of what you were wanting the robots to do so you had to decrease the simplifying in so to say the the approach so that you would be able to uh, to have the robots actually behave and uh, have this intelligent behavior uh, arising and so that that's a two uh, the two um, like two size uh, two side uh, um, uh, approach to it is that you have to decrease the resolution so you have to simplify and at the same time um, it's it's it shows that in in some senses when we have an idea of intelligent or intelligent uh, artificial intelligence or intelligent behavior that you want to uh, to bring to uh, some robotics or to some artwork also we have an idea of from our point, human point of view that we have to have complex uh, uh, networks frameworks etc and in the end and the, that's the other side with the the, the artwork that that Krista uh, uh, and Laurent showed uh, also for example even if w when we look at the ants, it's more complex uh, because of the the dynamics and so on it, it it's a different uh, approach but uh, when 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 we see with the flies that the discussion before we had was like okay there is something that is an intelligent behavior but it, in the end the, the the dynamic and the the coding was quite simple so w what what would you say that this shows in in some senses that you have to simplify uh, and then then with simple with like simple um, coding or simple logics you can end up with a complex or with intelligence uh, with intelligent behavior either in robotics or in, uh, in, in interactive artwork what does it say okay thanks yeah I mean uh, the um, one of the first uh, lesson from uh, uh, bio robotics is that we should not put too much into the head of the robots because uh, the robot can help itself through the interaction with the environment. It can exploit some uh, structure that uh, we don't perceive because we don't look at the environment through the, the sensor of the robot. But uh, the robot can uh, uh, find uh, um, environmental structure that can uh, definitely help uh, uh, itself to to develop uh, complex uh, behavior. Now, in this case, in the case of the, the dimension of the robot, uh, of the robot that uh, is uh, visually driven, 
the the resolution was uh, uh, was very very poor from a visual point of view, and this was because of a um, a methodological problem. So it was not something uh, that uh, we 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 were hammy for. So we were, this was something that we were forced to do it because we could not interface the the all the pixel of the camera with the input of the neural network. And nowadays this one would have been possible because nowadays we have uh, convolutional neural networks that do an amazing job. At that time we didn't have. Uh, uh, convolutional neural network, and so we went through this uh, uh, incredible uh, reduction of the, the input space, uh, which produced this very, very coarse perception. But uh, amazingly, we found out that uh, even that very poor visual system was enough for the robot to, to remain on, on the path because it was really using the, 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 the very, very uh, pure contrast between the, the, the different pixels and this was enough to stay on the road. If you want to add something about the, your hard work. Do you want to say something? Um, yeah, uh, well, the, the flies, <laughs> before doing the flies, the flies were done in, this portrait of the flies was done in 2015 and before that, uh, been, we have been doing a lot of different artworks with a lot of programming and a lot of algorithm and a lot of parameters tweaking, which was a uh, heavy work. And with the flies, actually, I wanted to play a little bit around. And um, my question was, can we distinguish something very, very, very complex to something really, really, really random? Because at the end, sometimes it's really similar. It's really difficult to, if it's really, really complex, it's hard to find out what drives every element. Look, look at an ant nest. When you look at an ant nest, you don't know what the ants are all doing individually because you have to follow every ant. And they all have uh, their behavior. They, they don't have a boss around. They do things by themselves, and they reorganize themselves. It's a lot of computation. They're even you, your brain is overwhelmed di directly. Yeah? It's a lot, it's too many elements, basically. And this is maybe our fear of insects, actually, that we can't control if there are too many. It's really a fear because then you, know, you, do, you don't know what, what's going to happen. Um, it's um, it's this, uh, this amount of information that then, if you look at something completely random, you try to find patterns most of the time to see if there is a logic in it. And sometimes you see something in a random pattern that is false. It's actually just an illusion. It's, you try to make sense of data that have no relationship between each other. And then the, the gap is very, really little sometimes. It's very difficult to perceive the, dif the, the difference between something, an event that is really completely random, or something that has really a logic. And so this was a, 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 a play. And I found out that, well, one rule was actually doing a very good job. Because we, we are intelligent by ourselves, and we can make sense of very, very little information on the screen. So just a few pixels, and then you see your face, basically. But it's because you actually perceive this as an information, and it's enough to reconstruct all that thing. So this is, this is an interplay between your perception and what the system is doing. And if there's just a little bit of information, just enough, just maybe a few rules, that's sometimes just effective. And, and we see that also happening within the organisms themselves. It's not extremely sophisticated sometimes. It's just very small mechanisms that actually just add it to each other, makes the things possible. And it is driven very, really well. And we see this uh, with, with the system you also did, is that we don't need an extremely uh, uh, complex uh, in information processing. Sometimes very, very little things are just as efficient. You. So th that's that's what uh, that was one uh, of the, the the question. Also, I think there is something that is connected to a question that uh, you had. Or, or, um, I think uh, Alexandra on well, to me, uh, it was interesting because of the actual um, uh, context of uh, around the AI uh, revolution that is going on right now in the. The public uh, at the public level, I mean, with the chat GPT and, and all this uh, this um, this uh, um, devices and, and and dynamic that that really like spread right now, and and we have an experience that is more related to the social to me to the social uh, integration of these new technologies and the cultural uh, revolution that it brings, uh, rather than the technology itself uh, of 
of a next step in the AI development. But I think the, and the, the both of your answers were to me uh, kind of giving um, a, a window of uh, of reflection for for this because there was something that that for me um, is is relating to uh, our experience of technology and how we relate to it and. Right, right now we have uh, like bigger questions of uh, around AI. Uh, it, it starts to be a, a huge matter uh, at soci society level. Questions of uh, would you, should we stop uh, at some point or, or keep on developing uh, freely and so on. And I think there is a, a fear that is rooted into a, a, a misconception or a misunderstanding of of what. Is the aim of an AI and and how it is and how it is working and that people are fearing like a kind of Hollywood movie fear of uh, of AI uh, um, like uh, re uh, revolution revolutionary um, revolution revolutionizing sorry the whole society and uh, being a threat a direct threat to the society the stability of society and so on because we are thinking of them as c very complex and and autonomous, already autonomous uh, dynamics. And you show with your d d two different perspectives, artistic in brid bridging between art, art and sciences, that, uh, that f finally the, the, the dynamics itself is, is not so, it's not so much about uh, something very complex and uh, it's, it's logical. It, it, to me, it's, it's kind of a ped pedagogical uh, approach to, or at least there is a, 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 a consequences of, of this, either with your di interactive art uh, installations or with your approaches, uh, Dr. Tucci, about uh, how we could like create this swarm of robots and how we could uh, like how we could create something that have an intelligent behavior or, or something that is close to uh, some natural uh, behavior. So w one link question that I had to to this uh, before more general question was that this also something that you that you touch uh, with your own approaches is uh, this emergent behaviors that you that you want to reach or that that's one of the um, objective or something that uh, that that rise out of what you created so you create a framework you create a, a whole um, either an art uh, in, in, um, interactive uh, art uh, de uh, devices artwork um, or uh, uh, yeah a framework for robotic uh, uh, integration of um, of of dynamics and what you want to bet on is this emergent behavior to to be able to help us understanding things what what is really what you expect from this uh, emergent behavior to to teach us about uh, about either our own at our own level as a species or a human experience actually before uh Responding, I have a question for Laurent. The, you show us the um, the last um, in the last uh, artistic work with the, with the um, flyers that write uh, letters, which, if I understood correctly, they 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 their movement, their behavior is reinforced by kind of mechanisms similar to the pheromone trails, or it's inspired. Is it inspired? Implemented, but it's inspired by. It. Okay, and. Oops, yeah. So and uh, so the basically the hands they don't have a, a um, they are not assigned any position. So everything is emergent in the sense that cannot the, the letter uh, emerge from the hands that they kind of reinforce uh, their trajectory. Uh, yes, but they, they detect that they still detect the lines where the this this. Um, these uh, contour lines are. So th they still are given this kind of information, and then uh, they decide where, where to go and to uh, reinforce the trail when they are actually passing through. So they attract more, more of these ends. So it's, it's reinforcing, and that's why you have a more cl a clearer image when they actually do a drawing, because they all go to the, to the lines, rather than the flies still move around randomly, uh, and some of them are just doing the lines. That's, that's, that's the difference, yes. Okay, no, it was very, very nice work, actually. I'll take it. And um, yeah, I mean, the, what do we expect from uh, emergent behavior? Uh, I don't know, I mean, I, I, a friend of mine a few years ago 
wrote a paper, uh, engineering, with the title Engineering Self-Organization, which is a kind of uh, um, contradiction, <laughs> because <laughs> the um, uh, self-organization uh, emergent phenomena, I don't think is uh, something uh, that you can really engineer. Now, here in the audience, there is a, a mathematician expert, my colleague uh, Timoteo, expert in uh, emergent behavior, that maybe can uh, later tell us more about this. Um, but uh, yeah, so it's uh, um, what we do in a sense, uh, it, it contradicts itself because we are, uh, we are kind of uh, relying on self-organization processes, on emergent uh, phenomena, without really being able to formally define the principles that generate uh, a specific uh, uh, result. So we don't have the recipe <laughs> to, <laughs> to get to the, to the final uh, uh, behavior, to the collective behavior, but we just uh, mostly to trial and error work at the, at the individual level, at the, 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 the interaction between the, the, the units, hoping to find the, the right uh, uh, combination of elements that generate the desired solution. On an artistic level, what we find interesting is when you are observing phenomena in nature and then you are recreating some of this on the computer and you show it to people and then often we get this reaction that they feel like, wow, this looks so lifelike or it reminds me to, I don't know, something in, in real life. So I think we somehow as humans have this affinity to anything that is living or growing or developing. I think there's a sort of general love of looking at things in nature or swarming uh, birds or swarming insects. So I think most people are fascinated by this and they in a way like to see it or like to be out in nature and observe this phenomena. Thanks. Definitely. <laughs> Poetic. Which is the artistic part of, of the work. Mm -hmm. So I just wonder if you, obviously, you have it before you start the work. And what is the reaction about the admiration? What is, what is your reaction in translating your input in translating? Intention, or whatever artistic intention is, and the, the the result that you see, there is also a poetic in, um, dimension to the result. Mm -hmm. Is it what you expected and can you influence it? I, I think that's a difficult question because, I mean, poetic is, is very... Art, artistic, yeah, poetic. Or artistic, uh, yeah. I think it's very there's always an intention, that's what I mean. Yeah. For example, I mean, going back to the pool example, Many people ask us, why do you make the pool and why do you put the water inside? Could you not just so show it on the screen? And of course we could just show it on a normal PC screen. But by putting it uh, like horizontal, putting it uh, with water inside, having this kind of incination, we want to emphasize this idea of the pool as a pool of life or you know something that maybe reminds you to some form of ancient Area yes, of was of that in the intention? Of course, yeah, yeah, yes. Okay, we we so, are artists. So, so you have the intention, you put <laughs> yes. it. Yes, and, yes, of and course. And if you're not, ha not happy with the result because of the um, engineering, can you correct it? Yeah, I mean, for example, at the very first time we showed it in 1994 at Ars Electronica, I remember we could only have maximum eight creatures at the same time, or more, six, more. six more, twenty. Okay, twenty. But, uh, you know, we were dreaming of having more creatures inside because it's more interesting if more creatures are there because then it becomes more and more complex. And for visitors, it's also interesting to see what's going on and try to follow what these creatures are doing. So, of course, we have always been dreaming of having more creatures in the pool. And now we have more creatures because the computers are much faster. But we also noticed that people who interact with this, they need time to understand what's going on. So it's very seldom that actually more than 20 creatures are in the pool. So sometimes the more technological solution you have doesn't mean that the work becomes better. 
So it's always a balance between what is available and what can you handle. And sometimes it's good to have limits too. And, you know, deal with the limits in a creative, artistic way. I'm not sure if that answers exactly your... No, it doesn't matter. This mm -hmm. is a good answer too. Or in the case of the plant growing installation there, for example, it's important that the room is very dark, it looks a little yeah, bit mysterious. It looks beautiful, but I was just wondering if you can, at the end, come back because you're not happy with the result and correct it to be um, pleasing to your intention. Or you, or you, you are as uh, um, uh, baffled by, 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 by what you see when you work. Yeah, we are often surprised and puzzled because each time people behave very differently. You know, in every exhibition it's totally different, even though we know that generally how people will react. But for every situation and every exhibition it's different. I remember we had it at ZKM and there was installed a bit differently, so people react very differently in every country and in every situation, which is exactly why we love it, because it's, you know, it so you. unique. Yeah, mm -hmm. And here is great <laughs> at Imal. Is it still here? Okay. So I, I have um, uh, another question that I, but I kind of um, uh, already, well, you kind of uh, al already answered a little bit on the, on this path. So I will, uh, I will um, ask it. Uh, uh, now, but um, so it's a more general uh, question, and uh, it's more oriented uh, for, for for you, Christian Laurent. But uh, I think uh, uh, Dr. Tucci will will also also something uh, um, related to to that. So it's a more general question, but uh, I would uh, I would like to see or to know. Sorry, uh, how do you see uh, the aim of your work that is bridging between technology, um, so so to say, the virtual world, uh, the human uh, made world uh, and the natural world in relation to our sensitivity um, as, as a species and our feelings um, about our place in nature. So more in general, do you, well, my two ideas when I was watching your, before experiencing it live today, but uh, looking a, a bit of um, uh, around what you, what you have done as an uh, artwork uh, uh, along the, the years. I was asking myself if you rather see that uh, interactive uh, artwork as a sort of magnifier for a potential interaction with nature, some, some kind of extrapolation or, or building on, on this uh, experience that you can have, or rather a way of uh, extrapolate or express artistically through uh, technology inspired by nature. So, so to say, if it's, it's more like a, magni yeah, a magnifier or an extrapolation artistically uh, inspired by, by nature. So it's may more or less <laughs> to... Uh well, um, yeah, <laughs> Hello? Hello? Yeah. <laughs> okay, so this one. Um, well, the, our attitude as an artist, we're both artists, we have all background in, in art, um, it's not so different than a painter making pictures of nature, except that we are more interested in the process that made the tree more than just representing the tree from the outside. So that's that's the probably the aim is to look at why things have a shape and how they develop this shape, rather than just drawing the shape. Now that's that's uh, the attitude, and for this we have to understand, uh, of course, the process by which. Uh, I mean, this this nature is is of course uh, not just predetermined. It actually has been evolving, it has been changing, and is still changing. It's not just a, a process that uh, ends, and so therefore it's adapting, changing, uh, finding new forms, finding new ways. Uh, some uh, things will disappear, some things will reappear, and therefore uh, it's a very interesting thing because it's it's based on creation. It's cr really creating, and it's really interesting as as artists to see how creation works and not just reproducing something uh, with the shape. And that that's a very complex uh, question because it's like what is life? What how how does it work? All these questions have uh, very uh, deep roots, and we don't understand all the processes. We just observe still trying to extract the principles, trying to see what is the interaction between all these uh, natural elements that have a different behavior, different reason to be, 
And therefore, uh, this, this, uh, we need science. We need science because it's based on this observation and extraction of information. And this is very interesting to see that uh, evolutionary process can, can be implemented in a computer. And a computer is a very, very poor environment compared to the world. It's really little computation to work. It's, it's enormous on, on Earth what's happening, and you can't really do that on the computer. But you can extract this in principle and re-implement it with code, which is amazing because it's a much poorer environment, but you can reproduce this process of uh, evolutionary system in, in, a, in a poor environment. So it's, it's still possible to actually uh, find out, oh, uh, a specific shape has a reason to be suddenly in a this poor environment, but it is very logical. And it has a history, it has uh, interaction, and uh, then it leads to somewhere. And this somewhere, it's not random. It actually has all this interaction from the behind. It can be taken from uh, outside uh, influences. Like we, we put uh, the public within the systems to reinforce this randomness, but also this arbitrary selection. So we are actually interacting with a system that could lead to a certain end, but with your interaction, suddenly it changes. And the path is changed, but it's still logical. And that's the, that's the interesting thing with the evolutionary system, is that it creates something that makes sense in this environment. And that's, that's what we, we, we like really much. I forgot the question. So <laughs> it was about uh, um, this uh, uh, interaction with nature. I mean, obviously, from a scientific point of view, um, what we try to do, we try to mimic nature to engineer a more efficient uh, uh, solution. But on the same way, we try to, uh, to, to understand more about nature by engineering uh, the solution obviously you will never be able to enter into the head uh, of a hunt of a bees so <laughs> in order to uh, find out uh, what kind of mechanisms uh, for example bees use to make collective decision um, you can only uh, test it uh, either uh, mathematically or by developing simulation model or with robots like for example I'll give you an example uh, a few years ago, a British uh, uh, biologist found out that uh, when bees uh, swarm to find a place where to build a nest and then they come back, so you imagine these bees, they scout, they, 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 they go around, they explore the environment and then they come back, and then within the nest, the, the swarm, they have to make a decision. Now when they make this decision, only 5% of the swarm um, knows the um, the, 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 the potential uh, uh, solution to the problem or the potential destination, and none of the bees knows all the solution. So obviously you imagine it's very hard to choose the best one where you don't know all the options. But the, the bees, he managed to optimize the decision which process which is called collective, uh, collective decision making. And the, 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 what we do in, in, for example, in swarm robotics, we try to, to, to use robots to um, to to mimic this uh, collective decision, and we test uh, uh, possible uh, individual uh, uh, opinion selection rule to see which one generate uh, the best uh, uh, decision, uh, both in terms of uh, quality of the solution, in terms of speed of the decision, etc. So there is this kind of common. Uh, there is uh, biology for, for engineering and engineering for biology. I don't know if this was the... <laughs> mm -hmm. Thank you very much. Uh, I would like to ask maybe somebody in the auditorium have a questions. Thank you. Thank you. Um, I have a question about uh, the, the artworks uh, that we saw downstairs, um, about the um, evolutionary algorithm. And my question is, uh, uh, do these algorithms have uh, a memory, like an history, or are we seeing uh, the, the same artwork uh, like the original visitor of the first exhibition? So uh, I don't know, for example, uh, if I have to do an example, uh, on the writing machine, uh, 
does that algorithm, algorithm know that uh, uh, certain types uh, of combination of genes uh, uh, allow a better result uh, in evolutionary terms and uh, the the system tend to us uh, tend tend to uh, <laughs> do tend to make reproduce uh, those kind of strings of genes uh, or is it just uh, Then maybe it works. Yeah, um, I tried to explain this uh, maybe for this artwork. Um, okay, so uh, I designed the system um, uh, through functions, and it goes a little bit technical. Um, okay, so in the um, in the computer you can make random, but it's called pseudo random. That means you can have uh, just numbers that are difficult to predict. However, they are actually uh, mathematically calculated. It's just uh, the the system makes it difficult to actually follow the 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 next number, and uh, there is one thing that computer does for this randomness that it doesn't exist really in nature is that you can repeat the random string. That means you can start just a, a string of uh, of numbers, and you can restart it, and it will give you the same string of numbers. It's a very very long string of numbers, and it's Again, difficult to predict what will be the next number. Uh, but um, I use this for making the creature. So a few letters of alphabet is not enough to make a creature. I have to decide the muscle uh, power, number of legs, how the legs are actually sculpted. It's all sculpted through functions. So uh, what, what one letter does is to call the seed of uh, the string that is going to be generated. That means the A it is the ASCII 65, it's a number, and is given to the seed of the random string, which will be a very long string. And from this string, I'm actually taking this parameter of the string to sculpt this, this, creature, this creature. And the next uh, letter will do the same again, sculpting again the 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 out of these random uh, numbers, but it's also intertwined. That means the first letter dictates how the next string will be read and how long it will take. And therefore, by doing this, the combinations of letters influences the way they look at the end. Okay, so it's for me not predictable because uh, it's too many uh, informations. And even though I designed the system, I cannot tell you that uh, AAA will do this and AAAB will do that. And so it's, but it's logically made. So therefore, it's repeatable. You put the same letters in the same order, you get exactly the same thing. You put 20 letters and you will get something else. And out of this very large number of possibilities, every creature will have a, a certain body with some legs. And sometimes they are dysfunctional, sometimes they are functional, it depends how, how they are built, and then they are put to the test. They are in the environment, and um, they, they, they have to try to do something. So I try also to minimize the way I'm influencing them to do things. Um, the, since they are built symmetrically, that's very important to move. <laughs> if you are asymmetrical, that's very difficult to move if you don't have a very sophisticated brain. We can do this, but yeah, simple creatures can't. Um, movement is very important, and so therefore to locate uh, either another creature or the food, they have to navigate uh, by just knowing the distance between themselves and the target. So that's the only one information I'm giving them, and by, uh, it's called successive approximation. Uh, they will try out to move with their body, and if they see that the direction is getting higher, that means they are, are going away from the target, they will try to do the opposite movement. And by doing this, they actually follow a path and find a target. They don't succeed all of them, but they, they, they tend to do. So very little amount of information, again, the minimum as possible, because if you give too much information, and you will agree about that, you stop the evolutionary system to a certain level. So the, the, more, the more you predict or you try to conduct things, the less uh, random you put into the system and less open it, it becomes. So 
Of course, you cannot really start at the atomic level, so you have to start with a certain level and with a design. Uh, especially in the installation, you cannot ask people to uh, you know, interact for an hour to get something. So it really has to be efficient. But um, you see that it's not uh, the fitness function is really working in the page. It's, it's just happening at this moment. They're competing with each other for food. And uh, the, 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 fact that the way they behave is just detected by the way they are built. And it's not pretty predetermined. So it's not in the genetic code at the beginning. It's the recombinations of this code of, with the generation that improve the, eventually the design. Okay? So this is, this is not pre-calculated. And nothing is actually pre-calculated in this. The only thing that is calculated is the environment. The environment stays the same. It's the page. They move. They are calculated with a bit of physics to have some friction, move the muscles. All this remains the same for all of them. I hope so. I explained it already. Thank you. Thank you to both. Uh, my question about your aesthetics, your, uh, the aesthetics of your artwork, uh, because by, when I entered in the space, uh, I knew that the, some artworks are from 94. So uh, the cons consequences of the, the limits and the possibilities of aesthetics of digital uh, coding. And then I shifted to new artworks. Uh, and there is no, sh you kept going to follow a similar aesthetic codes in your artwork during years. So you didn't shift it to a flat aesthetics or new aesthetic codes of uh, some uh, new artworks in digital environment. So I would like to hear you if it was intentional or if you had this reflection about aesthetics because the, the visuality of your artwork today and 94, it's, there's a, uh, red line, which is following. So I'm wondering how was your debates and the possibilities opening with the new technologies? Yeah, that's a good question. Um, of course, I think in the 90s, since it was so hard to make anything like interesting on the computer, maybe our work was more colorful. You know, like Avolf is rather colorful with this blue background and the colorful creatures. While uh, maybe the works we do now with the flies is more like black and white. So in a way, of course, it was a decision. We could have also made it very colorful. But uh, so it was more abstract and maybe a little bit more conceptual, the newer works. On the other hand, um, we don't really want to limit ourselves of not making anything more like in green or colorful or going back to maybe more plant interfaces. So it's more specific to each artwork rather than thinking, you know, like, oh, how should we make our aesthetic? It's more like that it appears according to the concept of the artwork or if it fits the artwork. But recently, for example, we did, we don't show it here, but we did a new work called Apis Romane, which is extremely colorful with lots of plants and very, you know, happy colors. We just had the feeling, okay, we want to go like really for almost kitschy colors. So this also happens and we don't have like a predefined concept of how we want to do it. It's more according to the situation and maybe also the feeling that, uh, that you have. And yeah, it's of course when you show works from the 90s, of course you see maybe or the experts see that this is more an aesthetic from the 90s, but they didn't wa we didn't want to fake it and make it now look to 2022. We really wanted to keep it as it was. And also thanks to the CKM in Karlsruhe, we were able to reconstruct the piece as it was, the Evolve, and we really tried to keep the colors and the code and everything as it used to be to you know, stay authentic, to uh, show it as, as it always has been. Mm -hmm. uh, somebody in the audience would like to ask, do you have a questions? Because we have to finish soon. Uh, because there is a continued program today. So just if you have question, one more question. No? OK. Okay, thank you very much uh, to participate in this laser talk. It was really extraordinary to have you all here. And uh, I hope that uh, we will see you soon again. And uh, thank you very much for you for coming and uh, follow us. And uh, thank you very much, Imal, just bringing this fantastic exhibition to Belgium and uh, to uh, make us possibility to do laser talk here so 
thank you very much, and uh, you're welcome for the next one. And now our program is continue. Um, we're going to have a 10 minute break, and afterwards we will have a tribute uh, screening. Uh, for Karin Lorenzlager, who is the curator of the exhibition and uh, the person that actually had the initiative to have this retrospective made true and, and tour and will continue touring after Imal. So this is a real living system. Um, though we want to tribute uh, her, we will have a screening where we will see uh, some of the things that uh, the role that she actually played in supporting media art, and we will also have special screening for Peter Bible. We also have uh, Philip Ziegler here with us, who will say also a few words to introduce the screening for Peter Bible. So I encourage you to stay, uh, and in 10 minutes we'll be back. Thank you so much. <laughs>